Well, good morning. Welcome to another edition of Hidden in the Heartland podcast. This is Kels Goodman, and I'm in Provo, Utah. And across the galaxy known as Earth is Mark Burris, who is in uh, Palmyra. And how are you doing today, Mark? Good. How are you doing? Doing good. So I'm excited to talk about what we're going to talk about today, which will be fun. But before we go into uh, St. Brendan, which I think a lot of people are kind of aware, but I think there's a lot of people don't know much about St. Brendan. I certainly didn't. Uh, let's talk about what you are doing, Mark, and a fun giveaway that we're going to be doing here on Hidden in the Heartland, especially if you are a fan on Facebook. So if you're a fan on Facebook, what do we got for Facebook fans today, Mark? So we are giving away um, a replica of the 1830 Ooh. edition of the Book of Mormon. Um, so this is a book that I publish. And um, what you need to do if you want to win this is, number one, you need to already like us on Facebook. So if you so don't if you're already like liked... in the heartland... Yeah. Yep. So if you don't if you if you don't like us on Facebook yet, go on to Facebook, like Hidden in the Heartland. That's right. You have um, to be number a two. What you need to do is you need to comment on this post. So the post for this episode, you need to comment. That's you right. Need to Write like the post. I think Kells is the coolest guy, or something like that. Some yeah. kind of comment. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't matter what comment. Doesn't so. matter the comment. <laughs> <laughs> you need to like that post. That's right. You need to like it and sh and share it on Facebook. That's right. You need to like it, share it, and comment on it, and that way yep. we know who you are, and then you will be part of a drawing, and then we'll. Pull your name out of a hat, and then uh, Mark is going to mail you that book for free, and we'll get your yeah. address and everything. So, so and if you you've from? if you've uh, never experienced the the Book of Mormon in the first format, um, it is reads kind of like a book. You know, yeah. see columns. There's no numbers. It's really um, I I consider it pretty clean. It's you know, like it's a, the good old days. A, Really incredible experience. Um, first edition also includes a preface that isn't included in any other edition. It's kind of giving information to people that lived in Palmyra at the time, um, yeah. kind of clearing up some misconceptions of what people had heard about the record of the Nephites. So we're just... We're super excited to share this with you guys. Um, these are available at Deseret Book. Um, they're also available on Amazon. So it's 1830 Book of Mormon Replica, Tomorrowland Press. They're published right here in Palmyra, literally next door to the Grand Inn building. So let's go over the steps again. Okay. Um, first, you need to like us on Facebook. So go to Hidden in the Heartland. Look at that. And like our page. That's right. Like our Number page. Number two, you need to comment on the post for this episode. That's right. Comment. Number three, you need to like the post. That's right. And then the last step is share it. Share it. So That's what we'd right. like to do is we'd like for this to be shared to as, with as many people as possible. Um, there's There's a lot of people that are out there that maybe aren't aware of our podcast. And we'd really like to, we'd really like for you guys to share this. We'd really like to spread it. So, so that's super great. Excited to, to send this out. Um, Beautiful we're gonna put, book. We're going to put a, th in three weeks, we'll, we'll choose a name. Okay. So keep an eye out on Facebook and we will announce the winner. So super excited. If we get yeah. enough people, we might draw for two. So yeah, yeah that's sure? that's a, it's a beautiful book too. I love I love my copy and and uh it's really it looks good on the shelf and it's also very historically uh I guess it'd be it'd be pretty historically accurate, Mark, wouldn't you say? I mean, as far as what the original looked like. 
Yeah, we, uh, I went, I've, I've done about 10 years of research on the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon. That's why I moved um, out here to Palmyra um, is for, for that book. I'm familiar with the whole process of, of what they did in 1830 to produce the book and added that in, into what we have. Most important thing is that uh, we put together a book that will last you yeah. can throw it in your backpack. You can take it with you. You can read it. It's meant to be read. Um, it's meant to be enjoyed. You can put it on the shelf and admire it, but really it's it's meant to it's meant to be read. And yeah. um fans of Hidden in the Heartland, what we're doing is we're we're exploring those that, that came to America anciently. And the Book of Mormon is one of the best records that show that that happened. Um, and to be able to experience it in its original original form is is pretty cool. So we just wanted to share that with you guys. Well, thanks, Mark. Yeah, that's a that's awesome. Though you you remember those of you who've watched season two of Hidden in the Heartland know that uh, Mark was featured. He uh, worked at the bookstore there, which is no longer there, but Mark continues to uh, work in uh, printing. And and in some in a lot of cases, he's very focused on the printing that has that was done almost nearly 200 years ago and the amazing work that uh, that started right there in Palmyra. And so uh, so good applause to you, Mark, on doing that. And uh, and and you can't you got it. That's why researching older materials actually closer to the truth of anything. And that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. So we'll segue right into that. Also, a reminder, we're also trying to raise funds for season two of Hidden in the Heartland and how season or three, I should say, season three of Hidden in the Heartland and how season three is going to be unfolded will probably be through, be through YouTube. But what we do, which is different than what we do here, is we hire actors, we're able to produce. You've seen the first two seasons of Hidden in the Heartland and you've seen you know, uh, the work that's gone into the research, to traveling to places to interview people and to hiring actors to be able to reenact certain scenes in, in history, whether it be anciently or whether it be just recent history. Uh, these are things that take money. None of it goes to me by any means. It all goes, it's literally a labor of love doing Hidden in the Heartland. And, uh, and so we ask that if you have a chance to help us out, uh, we're going to keep doing this podcast as long as we are physically able uh, to keep presenting new content or even just content that we just rehashed a little bit and updated. So we'll just keep this going the best that we can. And uh, and we're grateful for your attention. For those of you, you have made this a good experience. And uh, and our numbers and YouTube are starting to climb. And, and it's always a slow challenge when you're doing things on YouTube because there's so much stuff that commands your attention. And so uh, on this awesome Columbus Day week, I wanted to kind of go into something fun, and that is obviously the voyage of St. Brendan, who traveled about uh, what we theorize about 900 years before Columbus even came to America. This other guy showed up in a boat full of butter. What does that mean? We're going to go into that. So anyway, let's have some fun. And we're going to do something fun today because in an effort to be able to keep these podcasts going without me having to sit and edit them, we're, we're going to do a live uh, PowerPoint. And so here we go. And hopefully technology will be our friend. And so here is uh, our awesome foresty hidden in the heartland background, which is probably made by created by ai who knows doesn't matter so uh but uh what we wanted to do was kind of go into um who saint brandon was now you know just last weekend was uh, another uh, ancient american i'm sorry ancient artifact preservation society i keep calling it ancient american uh it, it may as well be but uh but uh, Ancient Artifact Preservation Society is a group of people that meet once a year, and it's an organization that Wayne May introduced me to. And uh, and I went uh, one uh, year about nine years ago, and then I went about two other times since then. Really enjoyed my time 
uh, because you're amongst probably about a hundred people who none of them Mormon, none of them LDS whatsoever. Uh, but they all have this common uh, theory that Columbus was the last to uh, to come to America, and not to not to dash, uh, you know, the work of Columbus, the good side of Columbus. But she said something really interesting. This this was a, a presentation done by Jill Baker, and Jill Baker talked about the maps used by Columbus, and she brought up a good point, and she said that, you know, at one point Columbus was a hero right? And then through time, we created Columbus Day, and then Columbus eventually became the bad guy and brought diseases and and wanted, and was power hungry and whatever. And we've, we've had so many theories and rumors about Columbus, and she brought up a good point. She says, but the truth is probably somewhere in between, and it's probably something we will never know a full truth as to the elements that led Columbus to America, whether he already had maps, whether he already kind of knew where he was going, uh, it wasn't necessarily like going blind and then running into America. We just, we don't know totally all of these things. A lot of them theorized, and we already know uh, that we have to be careful of the information by the whole concept of um, Columbus coming to America to prove that the world was not flat, but was round. That, as years go on, we know is false, and we know that most people did not believe that the world was flat and that he was there to prove that it was round. And so that was one thing that that one of those fallacies that through time uh, was created, and, and now we know it's not true. What other fallacies do we know about Columbus that we thought we knew that we don't know? And one of the theories is that uh, St. Brendan was uh was actually had come to america and so that's what we're going to go into is we're going to go into who is this saint brendan character and so so here it's, um, is the, it's, it's well, been interesting i don't i don't know if you're on TikTok or whatnot but i i must be in an algorithm with archaeology <laughs> but they keep on there's these little mini presentations on on ancient maps and how detailed they are and yeah. honestly unless these guys were able to you know take a spaceship up <laughs> the only way for them to be able to draw these maps was to be there yeah. um so you'll you'll you know I, I guess for instance like antarctica um they say it, was, it has only recently been been discovered like it's a it's a pretty modern thing like the 17 or 1800s is when antarctica was discovered but there are ancient maps that show antarctica there are ancient maps that show pretty detailed north america so who who drew those maps who came here and and went back to europe to be able to 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 present those maps yeah. so um the the idea is that saint brendan's might be one of these um one of the one of the people that helped helped produce yeah. maps yeah because you yeah when i saw when i went to this presentation that's a good point mark because you know when i went to this presentation she actually presented not just the saint brendan's possibility but she mentioned all kinds of others of people who had maps and she showed old maps that columbus could have used and there's the Great Lakes drawn in there. So, mm -hmm. and then there's, you know, Florida. There's a little lip there that's not exact, obviously. It wasn't perfectly set up with longitude, latitude, but it was there. There was obviously some knowledge of, of that Columbus probably had ahead of time. We just don't know, but we know that there are early maps. And to be able to map out, you know, places like that and have them come quickly is uh is pretty amazing is it would take a lot of work especially when you don't have satellite technology and things like that you have to literally do everything by measuring and you know you don't have a plane to fly over and you know so there's a lot of um things that they just did not have that allowed them to be able to create these maps so very good point mark so who was saint brandon that's kind of what we want to go into a little bit um St. Brandon lived from 484 to 577. So one of my cool thoughts is, hey, Moroni, St. Brandon, buddies, 
probably not but you know yeah <laughs> but they were but they live they could have lived around that you know the same year who knows how long moroni was around and who knows when brendan ever showed up but they probably obviously never met and uh um but but it is amazing to think that it's that time frame now so now we're dipping into actual some real history in in book of mormon time frame so here's a few facts about saint brendan he was uh, a monk and he was he was no he was part of what was called the 12 apostles of ireland so which is kind of fascinating uh he was uh also he had several names attached to him uh, over the years in in writings uh brandon the navigator brandon the voyager Brandon the Anchorite, and Brandon the Bold. And he was known for his famous voyage to find what's known as the Isle of the Blessed or the Promised Land. So he was told about this promised land to go to. Um, he was also he, looking for the Garden of Eden, right? Garden of Eden was kind of the original. That's right. The Garden of Eden was sort of the original thing that he was told and. And over time, through different translations, sometimes uh, the terminology was 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 changed and used. But yeah, the Garden of Eden was sort of the start, which is like, hey, you came to America looking for the Garden of Eden. Who knows? And so I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to review the books. And this is like I said, this is more an introductory thing into St. Brendan. I need to review the books, but I, I am not sure when talked about the garden of eden versus the promised land versus the isle of the blessed if it's the same thing or if they're different times that he was given these but we know it's these were words that were part of the vocabulary of the writings of saint brendan so which is makes it amazing and even to this day uh catholics and ang um Orthodox Christians and others, they, they'll they celebrate uh, St. Brendan's Feast Day on May 16th, which is cool because my birthday is May 15th, so me and St. Brendan got something going together. So so that's really cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, as far as sources that mention Brendan, you know, the main thing is you want to get as early as possible. So as Mark has... Uh, um, talked about and suggested the earlier the text the better and and in this case here are three books that have probably had translations over the years so you can only trust it as far as you can go but what's cool about this is here here are three possibilities because these these books do mention brendan uh the first one is the life of saint columbia and this is sort of a, a, a level of Irish genealogies. Um, this, this book was written uh, between 679 and 704. So you're looking at very early, even though it's after St. Brendan, it's very early uh, uh, mentions of St. Brendan. Um, also, the second book, the one that has an H and B in it, that's uh, called, and I'm going to butcher this, I, pro I apologize, Martyrology of Tolagot or Tolak, something like that. And it's a it's a it's a list of martyrs, basically. And uh and why Brendan's in there, because I don't know if Brendan was a martyr. That's another question that we'll have to answer, but but he was a monk and obviously, or he was amongst the monks. And uh so I don't know what what that would mean. And that was written in eight eight thirty AD. And then the last book there is, uh, is obviously The Voyage of St. Brendan the Navigator. Uh, there's also a, the book St. Brendan the Abbot. Um, I don't know if they're one and the same, but that was the St. Brendan the Abbot was written in 900 AD and was actually has been used as sort of the main book for the history of St. Brendan. Now, what's cool is each of these books are available on Amazon. So I just, I literally pulled these off of Amazon because then for you, the viewer, if you are interested in diving deeper, these books are available. They're not cheap. Uh, I think they're kind of somewhere in the $30, $40 range and they're, and maybe even higher. I can't remember. I think one of them was like $69, but, uh, 
but they're great information and uh and there 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 may be like the pdfs available the books might be old yes. enough that they they might be scanned somewhere um yeah know, there's like that... archive dot archive.org is a good place to go to find scans of original um of original texts yeah so that's that's a good point very good point because that yeah you can find I think I actually think the voyage of St. Brendan the Abbot is I think I did see that. Uh don't quote me on that, but I think you can find that on the uh the PDF site. What is that site called again, Mark? Archive.org. Archive.org. Yeah. Because you can find all kinds of old books. That's how I've read a lot of the old books that uh, you know, that you, you know, to to get information on ancient American content. Uh, because sometimes it's hard to find the physical books, even though I love the physical books, it's good to have it. Cause then you got it, but you know, if you can't find it, that's a good, good way to go. So one, one thing that's interesting that I just pulled up is it looks like St. Brendan was a contemporary of, of St. Patrick. Oh so yeah, that's right. That's he right. Was, he was, he, they were both considered apostles of Ireland. Um, one with with a little bit of my digging on saint brendan i don't know if he i know that when um catholicism kind of took over in ireland there was already kind of a pocket of of christians that weren't kind of their belief system was a little bit different than than the catholics so yeah. saint brendan is they've um there's several several different Christian denominations that kind of say that they're that he's theirs. <laughs> yeah. So so it it, it it it's that's something that's interesting. And um, as we go into the story of Saint Brendan, it's kind of like Christopher Columbus, where it's going to be hard to separate fact from fiction. Yeah. Um, but we do know that he was a navigator. He did go to the different isles. Um of of great britain and he did set up monasteries so we know of those travels yeah we know of those things some of the details of his travels um are going to be are kind of hard to say if they happened or they didn't yeah that's um, what we'll we'll go into that that's for we'll, sure we'll go into that yeah yeah because that's kind of and and like we like we said about columbus and the maps you know there's some things we know here some things we know here and we know that the truth is somewhere in between and uh, and hopefully we'll we'll find it but it it definitely continues to go through the notion that to think that columbus was first uh is is not you know that's that's now harder and harder to believe uh but it, you know who knows okay so the voyage of saint brandon the abbot and so this is the actual story i'm going to give a few highlights on this the legendary journey set out on the atlantic ocean between 512 and 530 so this is very early 16 monks in search of the garden of eden like you said uh and other texts other texts show that that there was probably 14 monks and three unbelievers that they kind of picked up along the way because they stopped at all these different uh islands uh, to to be able to eventually get to Newfoundland, and you'll you'll see uh, where it goes. Um, at the beginning of their journey, they learn about this place called a promised land for saints, which is how it's labeled, a promised land for saints, a place of those who lived a certain lifestyle and embraced the true faith of Christianity. So this is fascinating to hear that he was going somewhere, whoops, that he was going somewhere to uh, to a place called a promised land for saints, and it's where people already were living uh, a true faith of Christianity. So who knows it, where isn't that? Isn't it was. interesting that he uses he uses the verbiage, the true faith of Christianity? Yeah, I know. Isn't that wild? So what were what were they what were they living? What were they living in Ireland? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so obviously he's already he's already understanding that things aren't. Yeah, maybe the way that they should be. Yeah, that's a very good point. Very it's good really, point. It's it's a 
it's an interesting thing yeah so i'm i'm curious as to where this promised land is but i think it sounded like uh brendan and his and his group uh heard about it on their journey like like it wasn't like they started their journey looking for it they were already on their journey and they heard about it and then they went "Ooh, that's where we want to go and well, they, he didn't. He didn't point people to. Well, that's back in Ireland. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's right. It wasn't in um, Ireland. So the fact that he left Ireland, where there was twelve apostles of Ireland, means they were obviously in search of something higher, and and Ireland wasn't giving it to him or something. So, yeah, that's definitely definitely a point, a good point to bring up. So, uh, so here is. A film. Now, this is kind of fun, and I encourage everyone to, uh, if you're interested in a little more research, you don't have necessarily have time to read, you could at least uh, look up this movie. So this is on YouTube. The best one I saw was one that it came it came in two parts, but it's a movie made by Tim Severin. Now, Tim Severin was an explorer, and he explored many places. This is actually one of his earlier explorations he did many uh over the years um and uh and you can see his list on on wikipedia uh of of the of the journeys he took but this one was uh done in 1976 and 1977 and then the film came out in 1978 so tim severin uh what he did was he started his journey from trolley in ireland and so, uh, so that's where he started, and, and, he, and we'll show you the boat here in a minute. But as far as the journey is concerned, uh, he landed in several places. Uh, one of them was called Hebrides, Hebrides. I'm sure I'm pronoun- I'm sure I'm butchering it, and the Irish are laughing at me right now. Uh, Hebrides, and then Faroe Islands, the Faroe Islands, and then Iceland, uh, and then Newfoundland. And so that's that sort of the journey uh, that he took. So he wasn't totally on water the whole time. He was able to stop at the different islands by going a north uh, westerly, you know, travel. Uh, he hoped to find uh, the identification. Uh, Tim Severin, I'm saying, he hoped to find some of the identifications that are linked to Brendan's journey. And so, because when you when you read some of these, which we're going to show you here in a minute, some of the journey doesn't seem realistic, and so that's why there is that hesitation to Brendan's voyage, uh, to to taking it as gospel doctrine. And so, uh, there, like there like are Columbus, there so. are elements of his of his travels that it, it feels like it was. The rough draft of Gulliver's travels. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's, and that, yeah. that's something we were talk, talking about before. Um, yeah. So look, what's interesting about this this video that you're um, you're telling our viewers about is they 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 build the ship the same the same standards of the the ancient ship that was built, and they actually show the process. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, right. It's incredible. Like I was watching it and I was like, wow, that doesn't it's it shows in the in the picture in the upper left hand corner, yeah. um, them tying the letter. And it showed how many thousands of times they had to do that. Oh yeah. And it's it's crazy. But it's about um, it's about sixteen hundred knots. Uh, you know, and they what they do is they built the ship. So they tried to go off of what they read on the voyage of St. Brandon, the Abbot, the, or, or the, not, uh, the, uh, Navagatio something, something, there's a longer term for the, for the actual book, but it's basically, the book is basically just called the voyage of St. Brandon, the Abbot. And yeah, so he went the best that he could off of what he read and then, yeah, fashioned this cool boat. And it's in, this boat is called a Karak. I think it's Karak or Karash, C U R R A C H, um, which is a can. It's like a canvas boat, and uh, and it's got the wooden frame, and then they put a canvas around it. You know, they put this uh, like uh, animal skins. It's kind of shaped like a rowboat, and they they took these wo- long wooden parts as the frame, 
and then they covered it. Uh, and then, yeah, like you said, they lashed together two miles worth of leather strips. And so that, so when you see, see how much, how much leather they had to, to tie it, tie each of those elements in, uh, I think they said there's about 1600 knots that that guy tied. <laughs> so you, you can tell that went, that went a long time for such a fun trip. Uh, they wrapped, and, uh, oh, go ahead, Mark. Oh, it'd be interesting to know if, um, if St. Brendan came up with this concept on his own to yeah. wrap a boat in leather or if it was something that had been implemented i know a lot of the people that say hey the book of mormon couldn't be a true record because it shows ancient people you know traveling to the americas on a boat yeah well, this if if this is something that they had been using more anciently than saint brendan they yeah they prove in this video that it that you could take that type of a boat to America. Yeah. So it's either it's either more ancient than St. Brendan or he came up with the concept. Yeah. Of this type of boat. So well, and it's and it's uh, you know, very much much like Philip Beale and the Phoenicia, mm -hmm. you know, this is a very similar situation just 30 years earlier, where uh, you know, Tim Tim Severin, you know, tried the best he could to build this thing. Uh, he wrapped it with about 49 tanned ox hides is what it is. And they show you in the film, in the film, they show you step by step what they did. And they sealed it with wool grease. And in the book, it actually says that Brandon actually used butter. So, which I just, uh, the question I have is, was it margarine? That's what I want to know. Cause <laughs> it's not, I, that's such a bad joke. I didn't mean that, but the fact that he used butter was just amazing. Can you imagine how you smell by the end of that trip? It's bound yeah. to have been uh, a little, it, they, they mentioned that in the video, they said that the smell of the boat was just pretty <laughs> bad. Like it Especially, just smelled the, the leather and the, yeah. and whatever they coated it with, they didn't use this. I mean, you you mentioned what what they used, but they didn't use the butter. But yeah. they just said that like the smell of the boat was not not very pleasant. Oh yeah, <laughs> so. I mean it was, and and to spend all those days on that journey, it's funny when you watch the end of the video. The end of the you know comes the video comes out on YouTube in two parts. There might be some others that put the whole thing on, but when you get to the end, when uh, Tim Severin is finally seen you know, by a naval, I don't know what his, his, if he was a captain or whatever of a ship that was helping him come into Newfoundland uh, for the latter leg of his journey, the captain came on and, and brought him a gift and, and they shared wine together while they were drinking. And you could see him commenting <laughs> on the smell of the boat. And uh, like, you guys have been out for a while, haven't you? <laughs> you know, kind of, it was really kind of fun, but it was really kind of neat to see you know, that, that, uh, craft being, uh, being done and what a journey, you know, that's just, you know, you know, kudos to, to Tim Severin and, and his journey, but here's some of the, the places. And this is what we were talking about earlier is some of the islands mentioned that, that took them to this new world or to this promised land. Uh, one of the stops was an Island of sheep, which you can see, and these are early, renditions of what these are actually in the video there's actually stills from the movie uh where they try again tim severin is trying really hard to uh and, and through the narrator to to read one of the places that uh brandon saint brandon went to and try to find a real world answer to it um one of them was the island of sheep and then you see some some uh, images of sheep and things like that. And another one was what they called a slag covered Island. Fiery coals were flung at them by the fierce inhabitants. So, so that middle picture you see uh, there was uh, volcanoes and, and they said that, that these fierce inhabitants threw, you know, these fiery coals at them. When one of the theories is that Island was probably Iceland that Iceland would actually could be with its volcanoes could match that story. 
And so that's just the theory that they they brought up. And then and then um then you see the last one, which is the the most we're curious about, and that is this image of of them standing on this fish. Uh it says Brendan and monks, and the monks were actually beached on an island to cook a meal. And when they cooked the meal, then all of a sudden, you know, the and they made the fire. Then the island started to move, and they were like, "Oh my goodness, it's the great fish Jasconius." Uh, which whoever Jasconius is, and why would they stand on this fish and how it could move? You know, it's one of those "Come on, guys!" You know, stories Seems like you yes, know Jasconius was pretty well known at the time, and it's just been lost to history. Yeah, and and What's I that? can't. I have yet to find any more references to Jasconius. If any of you guys know about Jasconius, yeah. please say something on the comments it, nicely, it, of course. It, it changed <laughs> its name to Monstro and ended up in Pinocchio. <laughs> That's what it is. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's very this is a very Pinocchio-esque uh type setting, so uh which is pretty amazing. Um, it's also, um, I think of the empire strikes back, of course, as a nerd that I am and, uh, and the ship goes inside this crater while they're being, uh, while they're running away from the Imperial, uh, troops and they, they end up inside the mouth of a, of one of those creatures. And then they find, then they shoot a laser at the ground and the whole ground starts to move and they realize they're in the belly of a of a big beast. So anyway, that's my nerd time, but it's my show. I can talk about it. So anyway, <laughs> uh, and so so the question is: Was this whale a translation? Was it a translation as you issue? Was it uh, something that uh, that represented? Was it just sort of a folly? We don't. We totally don't know. And in the film, you actually it, see, it may have it may have actually happened. I mean, it, like, yeah. Totally. There might have been some sort of a, I don't know, a, a whale that we don't have anymore. Yeah. It happened a long time ago. So it would have been a giant whale. And yeah, it's totally, so we have no idea. And, and it's just, it's fascinating uh, to learn that. So here's a picture of, of Tim Severin, young Tim Severin. Tim Severin, obviously uh, he has passed away about three years ago. Uh, but he did a lot of great journeys. Um, he completed his journey to Newfoundland. And uh, and then in the film, this is what's really cool, is if you watch the film, you can see uh, him after he go gets to Newfoundland and they, you know, there's a crowd that comes and, and cheers him on and says, you know, uh, welcome home or whatever, or welcome to a land, because that's not his home, obviously. Uh, Severin then by himself walks over to a rock and he uh, he shows, he, he gives kind of a little speech about looking for the final evidence. That's why I labeled this slide, looking for final evidence for him. Severin walks over to the rock uh, in Newfoundland near, near where he landed and he shows Olgam writing on the side of a rock and he says that the Olgam writing was used by the Irish uh, between the fourth and sixth century, uh, and and that's that's the Olgam writing is really fascinating, and you can learn a lot about the Olgam writing in America B.C. by Barry Fell, and Barry Fell is probably one of those key people uh, that we've mentioned before on the program, and Olgam we've also mentioned in the program where we we had a gentleman on season one. Uh, from the Ancient Artifact Preservation Society, who brought a replica of his Olgam writing that was found on his land, uh, and to show that there was that was definitely a real language, you know, that was used. Where did he live? Do you know? He was in. Uh, it was either Wisconsin or Michigan. It was one of those two. I don't remember, but you can see you can see it. I think on episode two or three i can't remember uh but he he holds it up and 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 he shows it and um uh, but yeah you can you can see that uh severin says tim severin says that the writing on this rock and many other places will help the theory that 
Brendan came here uh, long before Columbus, as well as others, possibly, you know, that that uh, in, that helped that theory. In, his, um, in St. Brendan's writings, didn't he say that he actually found the land of paradise and that he was allowed to go in for a little bit? But yep, they, he went. He went for a little bit and then he had to leave. Then they were, you know, he was supposed to, to not stay for very long. So uh, it's interesting. I wonder who he met up with, if it was actually North America. Yep. You know, if he interacted with, you know, we, we talk about him being a contemporary with Moroni. Yeah. Or it's even three. Interesting because yeah. if he did, if he did end up in Newfoundland, it's not too far away, you know, to, to be able to sail up the St. Lawrence. Yeah. And it's not too far away from Camorra land. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, yeah. And it's, I mean, we know that ne that, that Moroni went West because eventually, you know, he went and dedicated the temple there or there could have been descendants, or we also have three Nephites that, that could have roamed. And there could have been others. There's so many others. Hagoth, you know, there's that story. There's there's so many possibilities, but the but the real thing that we do know is that there is evidence of this story, and there's evidence of the Olgam writing littered littered throughout uh northeastern uh America. And so uh which makes it really fun and amazing to continue to research. And um in fact, here's uh, here's kind of our last little thing is some other references. Now, we talked at the beginning about uh, Columbus and the possibility of his maps. Well, according to this gentleman, Paul Chapman, and again, I have not read this book. These are all books that I hope to dive into for future episodes. The Man Who Led Columbus to America. And in this uh, book is really focused on St. Prendon. And uh, so Paul Chapman uh, makes the case that uh, Columbus learned the currents of, uh, of his voyage by reading about St. Brendan's voyage. So now Columbus obviously ended up in the southern part of, uh, you know, the United States or that area uh, near Cuba and, and, and that area. So he probably took the southerly winds. But uh, but he does, you know, there is this, you know, we'll have to find out by by reading this book. If any of you guys have read any of these books, by all means, comment on what you know, and then we'll do another episode down the road with some advancement. Uh, I also have this other picture here next to it, and it's uh, it's the St. Brendan Society uh, that celebrates the belief that he was the first European to reach North America. So that's not just a Mormon thing. That's not just a, uh, you know, a Book of Mormon, you know, thought. That's actually, you know, real people that really believe that uh, that St. Brandon came and brought the gospel or came to participate in the gospel. That's the part that we, we just don't know, which makes it very fascinating. Uh, I think if you watch one of the um, uh, Stoddard's movies, uh, I guess they mention, and I don't know much about this, that he actually brought records with him, uh, to America. Do you remember that Mark? Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, I didn't, um, I didn't see that. So in their, um, their D their presentation, um, I'm trying to think of the title. <laughs> um, it has something to do with the Holy Grail, but, yeah. um, they, they actually tie, ireland and with the lost tribes that there's there's some some ancient legends that the prophet jeremiah after the destruction of jerusalem ended up in ireland and he started a school of the prophets oh and, yeah fascinating yeah and what's interesting is that 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 language you had mentioned um the ancient Irish, a lot of the a lot of Hebrew, a lot of Hebrew words kind of work back and forth with with that ancient Irish. Yeah. Um, 
so there's a lot of there's a lot of legend that really really supports that um groups of 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 ancient israel were were in ireland and that um because of that once the apostles of of the savior ended up in the british isles they were able to you know establish a a pretty strong church yeah. um that was there before the catholic church really showed up and and um you know demanded that people convert or die <laughs> yeah um so as part yeah. of that there there's stipulation that saint brendan in order to preserve um some ancient irish writings on christianity that he took them with him on his travels yeah um i really need to dig a little bit deeper into it but I, as do i, I. I've been yeah. picking up some books um it like i said it it it's a fun it's fun information but i yeah. i really need to read read into it a little bit more and and figure out one of the problems that you have with a lot of these early Christian saints, and even though it's, you know, 480, 580, that's still pretty early. It's so hard to separate yeah. that from fiction. Oh, it and really that's is. one of that's one of the amazing things about the scriptures, the gospels themselves, is they have been preserved really well without a whole lot of weird things creeping into it. And that's the miracle of the um, the record of the Book of Mormon is that, you know, only certain people had access to it. They were written on um, something that couldn't be changed, that couldn't deteriorate with time. So the original, the original was there, um, and you know, it was translated by one person. So yeah. it uh, that helps an awful lot. But like with Saint Bre Brendan, and then the things that anciently in the british isles um you know you're you're kind of going into legends and you're going over here and going over there and trying to piece together what you can um kind of you know crime scene investigator but <laughs> yeah and well and, a thousand years of information yeah, oh yeah so. that have been lost or that have been written or retranslated any any of those books any of those sources you you always have to take them as second hand third hand fourth hand you know you they, they really have been watered down possibly through time but i'm sure people have preserved the best that we can that they could at the time uh you know that's part of why Moroni and i use plates you know and and why others have used plates uh as a way of preserving the their text and so that they could continue to i guess when you really think about it, that's really the effect that Christ has had on so many people was, is it just exploded throughout the world with, with preaching that gospel. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, the study continues and, uh, and we will continue the study and hopefully we'll do a, a follow-up, uh, as soon as we, as soon as we learn more about St. Brandon, uh, and we'll just wrap up today for those of you who have enjoyed this. We hope that you will continue to to comment and to like and to share. Remember that we do have a contest going on for uh, a, a printing of uh, Book of Mormon from 1830. Uh, and bam, there it is. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, that's it's a beautiful book too. So remember, you if you're on Facebook, you got to be a fan of Facebook. You've got to like it. Uh, you've got to comment on it and you got to share it. And if you do that, that will, that will, uh, put you on a list of uh, uh, of a we'll pull it out of a hat. I'll pull a real hat and stick papers in, and then we'll pull it out. Then we'll figure out a way, but we'll make sure that you uh, that it is fairly done, and you can win that book. We also remind you to visit our Go uh, Give Send Go page, which is on the link in the description to uh, help us with Hidden in the Heartland season three that we'll probably bring to you right here uh, on this YouTube channel. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mark, for being with us as we talk about the great St. Brandon. And we have more great content on its way, and we encourage you to stick with us. And thank you for joining us here on Hidden in the Heartland podcast.